Shall we go to the Word of God? Hallelujah. Jeremiah chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. If you have your Bible with you, we're going to read the book of Jeremiah, chapter 3, verses 1 to 3. Okay? We are still on the same theme. We are still reflecting on how Christ, Jesus Christ, is our magnificent obsession. And we are still considering how our lives we can allow and we can make Jesus our magnificent obsession. But we are going to look at it from different, different angles. We are going to right, reflect and meditate from different angles as how the Holy Spirit leads us and how He unfolds the Bible and the Word of God for us. Amen. So in this Jeremiah, while I was reading, I was just reflecting and it just, just meant, it just was something for me. That is a little different. If you have found it, say Amen. We're going to read from verse 1 to verse 3. 1, 2, go. They say, if a man divorces his wife, she goes from him and becomes another man. May he return to her again. Would not that land be greatly polluted? But you have played the harlot with many lovers. Yet return to me, says the Lord. Verse 2, everyone. Lift up your eyes to the desolate heights and see. Where have you not lain with men? By the road you have set for them, like an Arabian in the wilderness. And you have polluted the land with your harlot trees and your wickedness. Verse 3. Therefore the showers have been withheld, and there has been no latter rain. You have had a harlot's forehead, you refuse to be ashamed. So, Jeremiah is a very deep... If you read, you know, I always struggle with the book of Jeremiah. There's so many things, so many things. I think there are 52 chapters, if I'm not mistaken. So many things in this book that we struggle, you know, we just read. Uh, but we don't really... We know the background of the story, you know. God is warning His people. Ba Babylon is going to invade his land and God raised up Jeremiah as a prophet to prophesy we know the theme but it's not enough to know the theme if it is just to know about the theme then the book of Jeremiah is just one chapter huh? but why did God you know why did God spoke to Jeremiah again and again through all these verses so there are different things we can learn from the book Amen. So the one metaphor, metaphor means some uh, metaphor means to describe something. We use a comparison to make it uh, to describe that thing. So metaphor of harlot tree is very much used as a picture of sin in the book of Jeremiah. What is harlot tree? That means what is harlot tree? A place of uh, ah, Harlot is a prostitute, right? God used the image of a prostitute, a harlot, a woman who is like a prostitute to describe the people of God to that extent. And God felt that that is a very perfect picture. He used this kind of a picture to depict their condition, to describe that the condition is like a wife who has a husband and yet that wife will go around and mixes with other men, lay down with other men, and these are considered harlotry, prostitution, idolatry in the eyes of God. So Jeremiah used very, very harsh words, especially in this metaphor of harlotry, to describe the extent of the sin of the people of God. How would you like that for to receive such a prophecy? You are a harlot. Nobody wants that, right? But you see, we can either be the bride of Christ or we can be a harlot. We can be a bride who is spotless, without blemish, or there is no black and white. You're a bride or you're a harlot. That means our heart is not faithful towards God. And when we take time to think, sometimes it is so true. Are we truly faithful to God as a pure and a holy bride. Okay? But look, look, look at one very interesting principle here. You see, because of what the people of God has done, look at verse 2. 
it says, Where have you not lain with men? By the road you have set for them, you expect them, you want to always commit adultery and prostitution and harlotry, like an Arabian in the wilderness. You have polluted the land. Look carefully, eh? it says, You have caused the land to be dirty. Am I right? Polluted means you have polluted the land with your hollow trees and your wickedness. The last portion of verse 2. Right? And look carefully, this is a very interesting spiritual principle. Because of the people of God, or people of the land, because they polluted the land, they defiled the land. Look at verse 3. Therefore, the showers have been withheld because of sin and defilement against the land there was no rain it is a spiritual principle because look here because of the sin of abortion in the country of the USA innocent blood shed on the land it has polluted the land and the resulting there will always be a consequential reaction in a nature in a natural world that's why it will attract all kinds of disaster it is a spiritual principle you have polluted the land the shower is withheld then you see typhoon you see hurricane and some people say there is going to be a great earthquake coming to california or something is a spiritual principle. You see, there are lands, there are islands that are just wiped out like that. The country of Haiti, Haiti, just wiped out by a huge earthquake. Why is that so? In the country of island of Haiti, there are so many high priests of Satan. It's a land of darkness. It has polluted the land. And what is the resulting consequence? A great earthquake hit the land. It's true. It had, what the sin, the sin committed against the land attracted the punishment on the land. The pollution to the land has a direct consequence. So there are many levels of understanding we can huh, make use of this spiritual principle. Showers have been withheld. We can also ask ourselves, has the favor of God been withheld? Has the blessing of God been withheld? Has the, the presence of God has been withheld from our lives? And it says there, and there has been no let the rain. It is also a picture. If there is no refreshing, no renewal in our lives, we must ask, is this because of the condition of our hearts? We talk about the condition of the land attracting consequences in the natural world. Then, Jeremiah also used the picture of the heart as the land. He says, break the fallow ground. Your heart is like a ground. If your heart is hardened, if your heart is not in the right condition, it will not have rain. It will not have the shower of his favor, his presence. Amen. Are you following me? It is a spiritual principle. It is not that we do something to qualify for blessings on that. No, it is always the grace of God and the blood of Jesus that qualifies us. But it is not that, oh, I have fasted. Because I have fasted, I can, I can hear God's voice. That is not true. You fast is very important. But because you fast, you position yourself. When you fast, you withhold from eating. Your physical, you cause your body to be silent. Then your soul, you withdraw your flesh. Then your spirit becomes more acute in its sensitivity. So it is not, I fast. Because I fast, I will hear God's voice. No, you are positioning yourselves. Amen. 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 It's not what you do. Oh, I spend a lot of time. Of course, we and I need to spend a lot of time with God. The more we spend time with God, we allow the Holy Spirit and the presence of God to condition our hearts. You and I don't spend time with God. We are not exposed to the presence of God. We do not allow God to condition our hearts, work in our hearts, 
to hear from Him, to receive from Him, to know what direction to take, to know what is going on in your life. It's not possible. So it is not the spending of time, it's not the fasting. Oh, then I become, so people get it wrong. Oh, it's my fasting that caused this, it's my spending time. No. It's, we do all that to condition ourselves. We, we, to show that I value these things, I prepare myself. I prepare for that which is precious and worthy. Amen? Everybody get what I'm saying? So we cannot misunderstand that part. Amen? But the interesting part that I read from Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 3 is this where it says, You have had a harlot's forehead. Wow, do you want to know how it looks like? You have had a, everybody touch your heart, forehead. Hello, everybody, lift your hand, uh, touch your forehead. Do you have a forehead? Oh, everybody has a forehead. Is it a harlot's forehead? But it's not just about having a forehead. It says, you have had a harlot's forehead. Okay, number one, isn't it interesting? There is a forehead. And in the Bible, we have a consistent theme of forehead. You mean forehead? Is it just mentioned here? No. If you are a student of the Bible, if you are a student of end times, you know that forehead is very important. You are not supposed to put on the mark of the beast on your forehead, right? Oh, now you see. Oh, yeah. <laughs> You're not put, supposed to put the mark of the beast on the forehead on your hand. So this is not the first time. It's just that many times we read and we just pass and okay, lah, harlot's forehead. Maybe it looks a certain way. But there is a consistent theme throughout the Old Testament and to the New Testament of this metaphor of forehead. Which today we are not going to look at. Wow, what is that? Mark of the beast on the forehead, right? I'm, I have, I'm, six, six, six. Huh? Six, six. So how is it? You're not going to look at that. But you see, there's, there are many levels of truth we must understand. Of course, it is very possible in the end times, one day, everyone will have to put something there. It is very possible if it's a physical forehead. Understand? It's a physical hand. But at the same time, there can be another layer of truth. It speaks of a metaphor or so. Forehead is a part where? Is, is the forehead a part of your body? Yes. Where is it? It's a part of your head, right? Forehead, you cannot say it's part of your chest or what? Right? So head usually speaks of what? It's not here, it's not here, right? It's here, here, your brain, right? Okay? So it's a metaphor of ma many things, okay? Okay, la, let's, let's say it's, it's a metaphor of that which occupies our thought life, our consciousness, our attitudes. Can I say that? Can I say that? When we say metaphor, this is where you think, right? So it's not just your thought life, but your attitude, your consciousness. Okay? When we say metaphor, it's how you think, your attitude in your life. It's something everyone can see, right? It's a forehead you cannot, you cannot cover, lah. I mean, men very hard to cover, maybe women can cover, put a lot of hair, right? But it's something for everyone to see, right? Am I right? So it speaks of something, your attitude, people can see your attitude, and for yourself, it's your consciousness. What are you always conscious about? So there is one, many people say, eh, you know why Jewish children are very smart? Why Jewish people are very intelligent and they usually produce very smart children? Because they follow the word of God. Correct? From young, they are taught the Torah, the law, the prophets, the poetry, the law, the word of God. They are taught that. That's why they are so intelligent. So children, if we teach them the word of God, they'll be intelligent. They'll be very smart. Where do I draw that from? It's a, it's a spiritual, it's a biblical principle. Turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'll read for you, if you don't have a Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 6, i read for you from verse 6 to verse 9. It says, These words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Everybody say heart. heart. Of course, the word of God must be in our heart, right? Put Heart means what? We must appreciate it, we must treasure it. It's only important things to keep in your heart, right? Is something not important, do you keep in your heart? No, right? Oh, but important thing, people you love, people you, things you treasure, you keep in your heart, you remember. So, 
by the book, God told us that the word of God that is commanded by Him, we must, we must, we must put it in our heart. The treasure in our heart. Amen. Follow on, verse 7. How do you teach your children? You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them. You talk to them when? When they sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. What metaphor is that? All the time. Lah. All the time you can talk about the word of God. You drive in a way, you drive somewhere, you see something, you can tell them son can tell a doctor hey you know this one yeah in the bible there is something that you can learn this one shows something and at every opportunity we talk about the word of god to our children amen that is how the jewish people teach their children when you lie down when you sit when you walk when you rise up <coughs> correct go on verse 8 you shall bind them as a sign look here on your hand on your hand, everybody see your hand. Okay. And they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Look here, everyone. Where is it between your eyes? Your forehead. You see, even in the Old Testament, the mark of the beast. But here we are talking about the word of God. The word of God must be on your hand. You must tie it in your hand. You must put it in between your eyes, your forehead. Wow. Have you ever thought about that? The word of God must be a part of what you do, your hand. Every time you do something, your work, you cook, you teach your children, your whatever you do with your hand, must always, you must be conscious about the word of God. You are ruled, you are governed by the truth of the word of God, by the spirit of the word of God. One day we will go into that because today we are not going deep into this. But look at the secret of the Jewish parents. Of course, in the letter of the Bible, they actually tie something. If you see Jewish people, they tie something. They wear something on the forehead. They wear some. Yeah, they wear something here and they wear something in their hand. It's real. That's physical. But this is the letter of the word. Don't go back today and buy something and wear some, somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the spirit of the word is. Old Testament in a, is a shadow, New Testament is the reality, right? So the, before the mark of the beast can be put on your head, on your forehead, we have the word of God ruling our, the way of our lives, ruling our thought life, ruling our consciousness, ruling our attitude. Hallelujah. Actually, there's very, there are many more I want to talk about this, but this is not the theme of what we're going to say here. So, but look, the Word of God must be conscious in our mind. So it speaks about our attitude, our thought life. You can take it down, Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 8. It says the same thing. Bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. So number one, the forehead is a metaphor of your consciousness, your attitude, the rule that you live by, your thought life. The sec in case you say, not enough, I want one more example. I give you another example, Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4. In Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, God said to him, go through, God said to the prophet Ezekiel, go through the midst of the city, through the midst of Jerusalem, put a mark on the foreheads. Okay, forehead again. Okay. You see, Ezekiel chapter 9 verse 4, put on a mark, a mark on the forehead of the man who sigh, who cry over all the abominations that are done with it. Wow, so dangerous, you see. In the book of Ezekiel, it's either, you know, for example, I'm giving a uh, general example. If God wants to punish a group of people and God wants to save a group of people, same like Passover, right? You put a mark in the doorpost. You put the blood on the doorpost. So when the angel of death comes, it will pass over every house that has the blood. Amen. You remember that? So this is similar. In the book of Ezekiel, God said, those people who sigh, who cry over the sin in the land, you put something on their forehead. It speaks of what? You put a mark on their forehead to to as assign this group of people their attitude, how they treat 
the scene of the land. Many people today we know the scenes of the land. For example, we know of corruption. For example, I'm just giving an example. In a, maybe in the US, everyone is aware of abortion. Christians are aware of abortion, aware of all kinds of scene, right? Fornication, adultery, corruption. Now, what is your attitude about it? If we watch the movies every day, we will think every movie has a adultery element, 100% one, correct or not? Mm -hmm. Every movie, you know, the man, the woman, the woman will flirt with another man and end up, sure one. Violence is very much an element of every movie, correct? But here Ezekiel say, if you identify with them, of course you will not cry over this sin. Your attitude towards sin is like commonplace. Everyone is doing it. It's just another movie. It's just another thing. If that is the case, you will not receive a mark on your forehead. The good mark, you will not receive. See, your consciousness, your attitude towards sin. So this one clearly tells us, just now I show you, the word of God must be on the, between your eyes. And now here it says, the, a mark will be put on forehead on those their attitude towards the sin in the land is, what do they do? They are sad. They cry over the sin of the land. Let's be honest. Do we take that view? Do you cry over the sin of the land? No. Let's be honest. I mean, sweet. But we don't feel anything when people divorce are uh, normal. Uh. Until to the extent in the US today, they are saying, shame on the church. We have brought abomination to God. The rate of divorce in the church is more than outside the church. <laughs> and what is your view? Ah, normal. You say, oh, yeah, this is like that, uh, normal. When you be watch violent acts in a TV, I'm also guilty. I watch like, hey, like nothing only, right? Mm, a lot of people not on each other's car, like, like very nice to watch. Bang here, bang there, kill here, kill there. <laughs> like nothing one, like. Like, nice to what, right? They can't do nothing. Nothing. What? How do you view the scene of the world? The scene of the land? Do you see that? So, number one, the metaphor of your attitude, the how you, or your consciousness, your thought life, your principle in life, that is your forehead. Okay? That is the, the metaphor of forehead. What does it speak of? Number one, the principle you hold, the consciousness, the attitude, your thought life. Okay? Number two, like what my wife said, the mark of the beast. What is that? <coughs> Forehead also speaks of your devotion, your allegiance. Because in Revelation chapter 13, verses 16 to 17, this one speaks of uh, the end time. It says, He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. It speaks of allegiance. I'm, I'm aligning myself with the Antichrist. You want to be aligned with the system of the world? You want to be aligned with the... You want to pledge allegiance to this system of the beast? You take the mark. You take the mark. So forehead, number one, speaks of your attitude, the principle you hold, the thought line, your consciousness. And number two, it speaks about your allegiance, your devotion in life. It starts even now. Now nobody will force you to take a mark. But ask yourself, ask myself, am I devoted to the system of the world? Or am I devoted to the kingdom of God? Do I pledge allegiance to the kingdom of this world or the kingdom of God? Amen. Just now we talk about how the Jewish people they educate and they raise their children, right? That's a very important principle. I just want to put a footnote here because I just thought about it. You see, there is a danger in the end times. As much as we have this spiritual principle that we have to educate our, educate our children, raise them well, the Bible says there is a man named Eli. Eli who didn't Samuel was a prophet, did not take care of the children. Mm. And it is a very dangerous thing in the end times. If we do not take care of our children, we end up destroying our children. Amen. Mm. We, got to, we got to be 
we've got to be cognizant of this. I cannot leave my children, let them do what they want. Amen. We have the responsibility. Okay? So what do we pledge our allegiance to God or do we pledge our devotion and allegiance to the kingdom of this world? And in the New Testament, it clearly says as a principle in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 10, I read for you, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Last week, I told you, right? It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. Remember that? It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom of God. As much as God wants to share the access to his realm, to his kingdom, to walk in his kingdom, to access his kingdom. As much as that is his heart's desire, not everyone can inherit it. Do not be deceived. Verse 9. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. As much as God the Father wants to give us the kingdom of God, if we fall under any of this category, you and I cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And don't just say, oh, I'm not an adulterer, I'm not a fornicator. Are you an idolater? Are you an adulterer? Like what Jeremiah said, of course you are faithful to your wife. But are we faithful to God as a bride? Are we worshipping Him and Him alone? If we have other idols in our lives, we are idolaters. If we are idolaters, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Let's put it very plainly. If we love the world, if we love God, we cannot access, inherit the kingdom of God. Let's make it very plain for everyone. And amen. Let us not compromise. It is as clear as that. As clear as that. Things are getting... The forces of darkness are making things to become more and more less clear. They insist that I was born this way. I was born this way, so can live like a homosexual. That is all rubbish and lies and deception. That is why if you are not founded on the word of God in your life, you begin to believe these lies. Oh, maybe, or oh, maybe God created like that, them like that, and then they have this thing. It is all rubbish. The forces of darkness are telling you, the forces of evil, they try to confuse the people everywhere. No, they are born like that. For you, you all don't love them. Ah. Homosexuals have no place in the kingdom of God. Everyone say amen. amen. That is the standard of the word of God. There is no compromise on that. As much as we want to say a lot about homosexuals, why? Because we are not. Correct or not? We feel comfortable, not to, uh, we can be very angry and talk about, you know, homosexuals cannot inherit the kingdom of God, right? Because we think that we are not, that's why we are safe. But can we say with the same vigor, with the same fervor and enthusiasm, God says adulterers also cannot, covetous also cannot. Why is covetous? Greek. Greek, huh? greed, greed, covetous cannot get kingdom of God. We can be very excited to talk about homosexuality because we are not, right? But can we talk about covetousness? Do you see that? Do we have to talk about huh? Covetous people have no access to the kingdom of God. What else does it say? Drunkards. Oh, yo. Anybody drunkard here? <laughs> <laughs> Revilers. Extortionists. Don't say, yeah, this one all old fashioned. This is the word of God. This is the standard of God. You and I choose today. Maybe some say, no, no choice, no, my son is like that, no choice, no, my daughter is like that. Who says so? This is the standard that we do not compromise. Thieves, sodomites, adulterers, idolaters, fornicators. So actually, it's not just a harlot's oil. There are so many types of oil, right? 
a covetous forehead will not inherit the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. An idolater forehead cannot. Amen. So I'm just I, I'm not sure if I can finish everything on this forehead today, but let's just go to the very important one. Every time, whenever we look at the word of God, we have to understand the principle of it. Let's we always use the law of first mention. When was it first mentioned for him? You understand? When was it first mentioned in the Bible? For example, I told you many times before. You have to understand the house of God, Bethel, right? You have to understand about church. You go to the first mention of the word Bethel in the Bible. That is the seed form. That is the original intent, the, the heart of God. How God wants the house of God to be. That was when Jacob encountered the ladder to heaven. Angels ascending and descending. What does it tell you? The church or the house of God is supposed to be a gateway to heaven. People come to the church, they should be able to access the kingdom of heaven. Amen. That's the original intention. The original. So, the first time forehead is used is when it speaks about the priestly garment. Priestly garment. Everyone say priestly garment. Priestly. What is a priestly garment? What the priest wear, okay? Are you a priest? If you are a priest, raise your hand. Yes. We are kingdom of priesthood, lah. We are all priests, okay? Priests, priests, priests ministering to God. One day, we'll, one, day, one day we'll speak a lot on this because we are priests of God. Amen? Amen. So this is the garment for the priest, for Aaron. I'm going to read for you from Exodus chapter 28. If you have your Bible, I would suggest that you read with me also. Exodus 28. Exodus 28, verses 33 to 38. If you have found it, say Amen. Oh, nobody has found it. Very honest. Exodus 28, verses 36 to 38. Okay? You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet holiness to the Lord. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and engrave on it like the engraving of a signet holiness to the Lord. And you shall put it on a blue cord that it may be on the turban. It shall be on the front of the turban. Everyone see? 20, Exodus 28 verse 38. So it shall be on Aaron's forehead. Everybody say forehead. Whose forehead is this? Aaron's forehead, that Aaron may bear the iniquity of the holy things which the children of Israel hallow in all their holy gifts. And it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Each time the priest go and minister in the holy place and the holy of holies, what must he do? He must put on this turban. In front of the turban, there's a gold plate. In a gold plate, it is written, Holiness unto the Lord. And it is a blue turban that the priest will wear. In front of it is a gold plate. It says, Holiness to the Lord. And according to the word of God, it says, Every time they minister in the tabernacle, he, he must wear this. And this holiness to the Lord will sanctify the things that the Israelites bring. Their sacrifices that they bring to the tabernacle, they bring to God. Sometimes it may contain some impurities. But it is a sign that when this Aaron put on this garment, even this will sanctify the offering brought by the people of God. So you understand that part, right? Hello? Okay, so that's the basic part of it. So the original intention for everyone, our forehead is all supposed to be like Aaron's forehead. We ask the original idea of God is our forehead to wear this golden plate that says what? Holy. 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 That includes you and me, kingdom of priesthood. We must have a golden plate on our forehead. We must wear a golden plate on our forehead that says, Holiness to the Lord. Kadosh. 
to the Lord. Holy to the Lord. That is the original intention. And what the English language cannot capture in the word kadosh is when we sing holy to the Lord, what does it actually mean? The word kadosh actually has a more richer word and meaning than holy. Holy, we say, oh, something is holy, that means it's not defiled, right? It's holy, right? But actually, the word kadosh, the Hebrew word kadosh means set apart. Set apart. Set apart. It is, this is a holy guitar. It's set apart only to play worship songs. For example, I'm just giving an example. This is holy. This is meant to be kadosh. It is set apart to God only. Wow. Your forehead is supposed to have a gold plate that says holiness to God. Your consciousness, your thought life, your attitude should always acknowledge this reality that you are born, you are created, you are born in this world, you are part of God's people, you are set apart to God. That is why Jeremiah said it so harshly and so emphatically. You have had a harlot's forehead. God was speaking to his prophet. The people of God has lost that holiness unto God. That set apart unto God. There is now a mixture Yes, we are all still the people of God. But do, are we set apart to God? It doesn't mean that we cannot be in this world. It doesn't mean that we cannot work in this world. We cannot do anything in this world. But we should be so different from the world. Am I not right? We should be so different because we are set apart. But once you are set apart, Set apart, you are unlike everyone who is not set apart. You are set apart to God. Do you know the priests are set apart? They don't have an inheritance. Everyone gets an inheritance. All the tribe have an inheritance. Priests doesn't have an inheritance. Their inheritance is God. They don't get a land. Their inheritance is God. You and I will be so different if you acknowledge you are supposed to have this for a holiness unto God. It is, I guess, we cannot finish everything tonight, but I will just stop here. Look at the distinction. Harlots for a and holiness to God. What is the difference? Are we separated unto God? Or are we like a harlot who has a husband? But this wife goes around lying down with many other different husbands. Physically, you and I may not be doing that. But spiritually, in our consciousness, in our belief system, in our thought process, in our attitudes, in our consciousness, are we unfaithful to God? When we do certain things, when we judge a situation, when we are asked to decide on something, to choose this or choose that, do we show our separated unto God? Or do we judge and do we decide from a very unfaithful heart towards God? Where our decision, our judgment is always prejudiced towards ourselves prejudice towards the world. Brothers and sisters, we should take time to ask ourselves. We should take time to ask ourselves to review, reflect in the presence of God. Every day we should take time and ask God, how much of the world have I become unfaithful to you that I have allowed the world to be inside me that I am not separated unto God. Sometimes, hello, my brother, my sister, sometimes 
if you are really honest, sometimes you feel dirty. It's not because you don't bathe. Okay? If you don't bathe, you feel dirty. Lah. But sometimes you are, when you are in the world, when you want to come to God, you feel dirty. I feel like, Ayo, I feel so contaminated. Have you ever felt contaminated before? Or the contamination has become so common to you that you and the world the same, you don't feel dirty when you come before God anymore. That's a very dangerous thing to happen to our lives. Because we have not allowed the light of God to shine. We have not allowed the presence of God, the Holy Spirit, to bring conviction to us. The more we draw near to God, the more we realize how dirty we are. Because the increase of the light of God being shone upon us, the hidden motivation, the hidden things we do, the secret sins that nobody knows, the thoughts that we entertain, the things that we do, we do when no one sees. These are signs of our forehead manifesting in the spirit realm. Whilst people do not see, I do not see, you do not know about my forehead, you and I, do, we do not know one another's condition, but the fact that it is a forehead, it is a metaphor of something that is of a clear view to everyone. What does this tell us? In the spirit realm, your forehead is as clear as daylight. How faithful we are to God or how idolatrous, how fornicating we are towards God in our relationship with God is as clear as daylight in the spirit realm. You and I don't see, you don't see my forehead, I don't see your forehead. I do not know. Everybody comes to the church, everybody looks very good. Everybody dresses up well. Everybody has a church language. I'm blessed, we are blessed, we are living in a blessed world. But here comes Jeremiah and say, you have had a harlot's forehead and you refuse to be ashamed. We do not feel the dirt. We do not feel our unfaithfulness towards God and we refuse to be ashamed. Perhaps I'll just go quickly on some of the things that I want to say. I just want to touch up a few points. So the forehead, number one, is we see the law of first mention, Aaron speaks about holiness unto God, being set apart and being separated unto God. That is the original intention of God for our forehead. Amen. 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 Number two, it is also, number two, we also not just look at harlotry. Number two, our forehead also speaks of the sin and the pride in our lives. You don't have to turn to it. I'll give you, you go back and read it. Second Chronicles 26 verses 19 to 20. When King Uzziah cannot offer sacrifice, right? Because he's a king. He cannot offer sacrifice. He's not a priest. Only priests can do it. But because of his pride, he went to offer sacrifice. The first part that leprosy appeared in his body is his forehead. 2 Chronicles 26 verses 19 to 20. And that leprosy got stuck to him until he died. Because of his pride, he said, I'm a king. I can do what I want. He went against the word of God, against the spiritual principle, the boundary that God has set in his life. You are a king. You are not supposed to burn incense. He went ahead to do it. And the leprosy immediately appeared on the forehead right in front of all the priests. They saw it. He has to leave the place. The next one, your forehead also speaks of stubbornness and defiance against God. In the same book of Ezekiel, God told Ezekiel, I'll make you a prophet, you're going to prophesy to these people. But these people are going to have a very hard forehead. Speaks of a very stubborn heart. When you prophesy, they will not listen. But God told Ezekiel, I will equally give you a hard forehead to go to them. So this Forehead can be like a harlot forehead, meaning what? Unfaithful, adulterous towards God, love the world, have many parts, have many loves, not just one love. Harlotry, 
many love, love of pleasure, many loves. But God, uh, God is seeking and God is calling for a bride. A bride has one single love, love for God. And one harlotry. Number two, Uzziah, King Uzziah, right? King Uzziah's pride. Number three, Ezekiel, speaks of stubbornness, defiance against God. This one, I can give you another example. What's the best example for children? When David fought against Goliath, David took the stone and he hurled the stone and the stone hit the forehead of the Goliath. Do you see how many times now forehead is mentioned in the Bible? You see the theme and the truth that God wants to portray. When David saw Goliath, what did David say? You uncircumcised Philistines. Remember that? The forehead of the Goliath speaks of what? You, the reproach of Israel, you bring shame to Israel. You who are uncircumcised, you want to defy the army of the living God. So the, Goliath, the forehead of Goliath speaks of defiance against God. You know, you're stubborn against God. God tells you certain things, you're stubborn. If we are stubborn against God, if we defy, defy means we go against what God says. If we rebel against God's people, if we rebel against God's word, we have the Goliath's forehead. No two way about it. And he needs a stone to hit you down. It needs the stone to hit us, to kill the Goliath's forehead. It speaks of the uncircumcision. It speaks of our flesh. Our heart that is not circumcised is our flesh. Goliath has very much flesh. He's a huge one. All of us, there is no excuse. We have flesh, right? Maybe you have a, a little bit of a Goliath's forehead. <laughs> we have a little bit of a Goliath's forehead. We have a little bit of a Harlot's forehead. We have a little bit of a... Huh? Aaron. Aaron's forehead. We have a little bit of King Uzziah's forehead. But God doesn't want that. God just wants the same like a what Aaron put on the forehead. Amen. 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 The stone. Only the stone. Can only one stone hit the forehead and Goliath fell. David said, I come. In the name of Yahweh. I come against you, you uncircumcised Philistines who wants to defy the army of God. I come in the name of Yahweh. The stone speaks of the name, the character and the authority of God. Only the character of God, the authority of God will kill, will put to death the flesh. The stone speaks of the character and the authority of God. The stone speaks of Jesus. Jesus is the stone, the cornerstone, the rejected stone, the capstone. So the stone is Jesus himself. My brother, my sister, I pray that this is a message that we will take into take, carry with us in our hearts and that we always examine ourselves. This is not a popular message. Nobody wants to hear all this. We like to hear positive messages. You and you, some of you may be thinking, ah, this is such a negative message. I reject all this message. I rebuke all this message. Well, it's your choice. It's your choice. It's your choice. If we are always living on positive messages, we are, we are tearing a big portion of the Bible out from the Word of God. It is our choice. It cannot always be just drinking bubble tea, you'll die. You cannot be always just... <laughs> you cannot be just eating fries your lifetime, you'll die. The natural world is sending out a message. The natural world is sending out a message. If you keep drinking bubble tea, you'll die. If you keep drinking positive motivational messages, your spirit will die. It's the truth. It's the truth. Until we cannot tell the difference anymore. We don't feel ashamed anymore. I don't want that. Until we don't feel dirty. Sometimes we come to God. Wow, we are like, oh no. Here I am. Wow, like commanding God. It's very dangerous. Oh. It's very dangerous. I don't know who are we commanding. Now we are God. No, we commanding God. We come and so. Yes, we must come very boldly. But we must know. 
I will follow him. Amen. Amen. I'm going to end with this. So how? Come everybody, let's look here. What is the answer if we have a harlot's for him? What is the answer if we have a Goliath's for him? I would rather admit it, right? We don't have we don't have hundred percent aliens for him. What if you and I have Uzziah's for him? What if you have all this for him? I'm gonna bring you a picture from the New Testament. When you catch when you catch this, it will change you. When you catch this, you will receive this revelation. When Jesus died, when Jesus came, when Jesus was in the pilot's place, when Jesus was judged by Pilate, you know what happened? After he left Pilate's place, the soldiers, what did the soldiers do? They twisted a crown of thorns for Jesus to wear. It was a thorn that at least it was 3 cm full of thorns and Jesus wore a crown of thorn on his head. And when that crown of thorn reaches his head, it reaches his forehead. It is because Jesus wore that crown of thorns, your forehead, my forehead can be redeemed, can be restored, can be renewed, can be exchanged. But remember this. It was an expensive price to pay. It was not a simply thing. Jesus suffered pain. Blood oozed out from his forehead. So that your forehead, your our dirty forehead, our harlot's forehead, our Uzziah's forehead, our Goliath's forehead can be put down. All because the crown of thorns that were twisted. Who twisted the crown of thorns? You and me. You and I, we took part when the army twisted a crown of thorns and placed it on the forehead of Jesus. The three CM thorns all over the crown. The soldiers used it to mock Jesus. After they put the crown of thorns on his head, they put on him a royal purple robe and say, Hail the King of Jews. They mocked King Jesus. They said, This is the King of Jews. Worship him. Let him rescue himself. My brother, my sister, it was an expensive price for God to redeem your forehead, to redeem my forehead. Let us not return to a harlot tree's forehead. Let us not return to Uzziah's forehead. Let us not return. To Goliath's forehead. It took a crown of thorns. And because Jesus wore the crown of thorns, let me give you a message of hope. It is not a message of positivity, not a motivational message. Because of the price that Jesus paid when he put on that crown of thorns that pierced through his forehead, the three at least three centimeters crowns all over him, his head that pierced into the forehead, blood oozed out. And my brother, my sister, every mental illness, every mental condition is no longer a hindrance. It's no longer, it's no longer an excuse. If the medical world says no, I, I'm here to announce to you the crown of thorns that Jesus, that the soldiers put on the cross, on our King Jesus, guaranteed that our minds can have a we have can have a clear mind, we can have a pure mind, we can have a holy consciousness, we can be set free from every mental torture. Insomnia is not your inheritance. Schizophrenia is not our inheritance. We can be delivered from every bondage of schizophrenia or whatever mental issue or mental sickness because of the crown of thorn that was placed on Jesus' head. And it was an expensive 
painful, sacrificial, substitutionary position that Jesus took. When Adam and Eve fell to sin, God pronounced a curse and a judgment. He said, you will now sow among thorns, thistles and briars. Thorn is a symbol of curse. Thorn is a symbol of curse because of sin of Adam and Eve. And right there, the soldier took thorns and put on Jesus' head. The curse that was meant for you, for me, you and I inherit curse from our first parents. Adam and Eve fell into sin and our rightful inheritance, our rightful, what you and I should get is curse. That's the truth of it. That's the spiritual principle. That's the spiritual consequence of sin. You and I are supposed to be inflicted with every form of curse. Right from Genesis, we are told, God pronounced a judgment because you ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You and I, we are destined to live a life of curse. But on that fateful day, when Jesus was on the court of Pilate, when he was led out, the soldiers took a crown or, or took thorns and made it a, a crown and placed it on his head. He took upon the crown of thorns for you, for each one of us, for me, for everyone who is listening to this message. This is your hope. Whatever your illness, whatever your problem with your attitude, your mind, if it is impure, if you cannot control, you have bondage of the mind, you have issue of your mind, if you have sickness in your mind, see, look and behold the crown of thorn that was placed on Jesus' head. And that is your hope and you will walk out and into your breakthrough because of the crown of thorn that Jesus had on his head. There's no excuse. I mean, this bondage, uh, this is the way I'm brought up, this is so and so, uh, then this is so and so, my brother, my sister. If you take a stand of no compromise on the word of God, on the principles of God, on sin, on harlotry, adultery, uh, and all this idolatry, if you take a stand and say, yes, this is so, I'm not going to compromise on it, you reap the fruit of it, which is because you took a compromise of sin and holiness you can reap what Jesus has done. If we play a compromise game, maybe we can do a little bit of world, do a little bit of the flesh, do a little bit of compromise. How can we reap the expensive price that Jesus paid on the cross? That Jesus took upon himself the crown of thorn. Are we making fun of Jesus? If we are not, if we are compromising on sin, are we making fun of Jesus? Are we trampling on his suffering? Are we making fun and taking it lightly? That is a great sin. If we are taking lightly, if we treat sin lightly, we are taking the crown of thorns that was placed on the head of Jesus lightly. It was always meant to be a serious thing. Gee, God himself pronounced a judgment of curse on mankind. And all our problems, let's put it very clearly, all your problem existing long time going to be all our problem stem from the issue of sin. There are no two ways about it. It's because of sin. Our sinful heart, our sinful forehead, our attitude, consciousness, our principle, our the way we live, the way of our lives are so sinful that it necessitates, it requires God to take on that one to redeem our foreheads. My brother, this is the hope for you. You can have a new forehead. My sister, this is the hope for you. You and I can walk in the kingdom of God with a new forehead, with a new mind, the mind of Christ, with a new consciousness, with a new set of principle, kingdom truth principles. But that depends on your attitude very much on how we see sin. Do we treat it lightly? Are we trampling on what Jesus has done? Remember, he took a crown of thorns he, that was placed on his head. And we are not talking about short thorn. It was a long thorn that pierced right into the temple, into the forehead of Jesus for a clear reason to redeem you, to redeem me. Amen. I want you to just close your eyes for a moment as we 
reflect on the crown of thorns. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that you are a good God. We thank you for the revelation of your word that you are showing us. Thank you and we welcome you, Holy Spirit, in this hour, in this moment, as we open our hearts. And we ask that, Lord, please speak to us. Please reveal to us. Lord, when the soldiers twisted a crown of thorns, and when it was placed on your head, Lord, what was it, O oh God? The pain that you went through, the mockery, when they mocked you, the King of Jesus, the King of Jews, when they mocked you, Lord. My brother, my sister, I want you to, in your heart, begin to open your, the mind, your eyes of your heart. And God will begin to show you the suffering of Jesus, the crown of thorn that was placed on Jesus. That is a picture of suffering that was a picture of mockery. They are laughing. You can't do anything. You claim to be king, but you can't do anything. It shows you are helpless, which is the truth. Many of us, sometimes we are in helpless position, in helpless state. I can't do anything about this. And it tempts us, it to tempts us to make the wrong decision. We compromise on our principles. We compromise on our standards. We think that no one can help me, so I might, might as well, I try this out. And we begin to become the unfaithful harlot. We become, we become the harlot inside us. We begin to seek help from other husbands, from other men. We look to other men for help. When our one and only husband is Jesus himself. We begin to call out to other men. We begin to seek help. We begin to glorify and exalt and magnify everybody and not Jesus. Father, heal us. Even at this moment, as you picture the crown of thorns in your mind, Father, the blood that drips out from the crown of thorns, Father, let that blood begin to wash, begin to wipe away the sin of harlotry in our hearts, the sin of unfaithfulness towards you, Lord. Holy Spirit, begin to use the blood of Jesus begin to apply it into our hearts, our conscience, our minds, our imagination. Wash them, Lord. Just close your eyes. Begin to, in the, in the eyes of your heart, begin to picture the crown of thorns that is placed on the head of Jesus. Yes, look at that crown that was pierced into the head, that pricked into the forehead. Begin to see the areas of your defiance, your stubbornness, our stubbornness, our defying against God, our arguing, this is correct, this is my way, I want to do it my way, this is my way, my way prevails over God's ways. As the Holy Spirit brings conviction in your heart, in the areas, how we have become defying against God, how we have been stubborn against God, how we fight and we rebel against the voice of God in our lives. As the Holy Spirit brings this conviction inside you, see the blood of Jesus dripping from his forehead, washing, cleansing, purifying your, you and my rebellion. Washing, cleansing, purifying our defiance, our rebellion. If the Holy Spirit brings conviction in our hearts on the areas how we pride ourselves like Uzziah who has gone beyond every boundary God has placed in his life. That the pride inside him, he didn't know that that, that was the pride. The pride in the king, in king Uzziah's heart pricked the head, the forehead of Jesus. It was his pride, my pride, your pride, our pride that pricked the forehead of Jesus. 
our flesh, the flesh of Goliath, our uncircumcised flesh, attitudes, thoughts, the way we do things, the way we speak, our fleshly ways. The fleshly ways of Goliath was the thing that caused the thorns to be placed on the head of Jesus. My flesh, my sin, my lust, your lust, our lust, the lust of our eyes, our lust of the flesh, the pride of life, the way we chase, like the harlot, like the description of Jeremiah, like the Arabian in the wilderness, how we wait, how we strategize, how we scheme, how fast we want to do certain things according to our way of thinking, according to the way of our thoughts. Lord, have mercy on us. Lord, cleanse us and purify us. The blood that flows from your forehead tonight, we receive it. Tonight, we receive the blood that has been shed. The blood that flows from your forehead, Lord. The blood that kept flowing from your forehead, Lord. Even now, is flowing. Even now, is cleansing. Even now, is washing and purifying each of our foreheads, our attitude, our thought life. Right now, receive the blood of Jesus washing you, cleansing you, making you pure. The moment you do not compromise, you admit and you confess, yes, Lord, I have that harlot's forehead. Yes, Lord, I have the Goliath's forehead. Yes, Lord, my forehead is, has leprosy. If you confess, your sins before him now in the bible it says he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and will purify us from all unrighteousness brothers and sisters and the holy spirit is present in our midst take this time to confess your sin begin to tell jesus i'm sorry lord these are the areas of compromise these are the areas of my heart a tree i'm not faithful to you wholeheartedly lord Lord, I'm not faithful to you wholeheartedly, Lord. Forgive me, Jesus. Forgive me, Lord. Have mercy, Lord Jesus. Lord, the dirt, I have not felt how dirty I was, how dirty I am when I approach you. Forgive me, Lord. Like what you pronounce on Jeremiah, you feel no, you're not ashamed. Come, Holy Spirit. The light of Jesus shine upon every heart tonight. The conviction of the Holy Spirit upon every heart tonight. Just open your heart and tell Him, let's not keep quiet. As the Holy Spirit is working in you, He begins to maybe bring a picture, a memory of the things you have done. Your flesh, your, your sins, your unfaithfulness. As He shows it to you, begin to confess them before Him one after another. Lord, I'm sorry. <coughs> Lord, my attitude, my pride, Lord, my gossiping, Father, Lord, my unthankfulness, my ungratefulness, cleanse me, Lord. In this period of time, Lord, of reflection, of repentance, Lord, I bear my soul, my heart open to you, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit convict me, open my eyes to see the contamination inside me. Wash me, cleanse me with your blood tonight. Wash me, cleanse me. Wherever you are, the Holy Spirit is present now. Talk to Him, talk to Him. Open your heart and talk to Him. Forgive me, tell Him, Lord, this is my sin. Lord, this is my wickedness. Lord, I compromise. Lord, when there are things that trigger the flesh inside me, I fell into sin, I succumb into temptation. I compromise in my areas of faith. Forgive me, Jesus. I don't see you as my source of strength. I don't see you as my only source of help, source of hope. Father, in Jesus' name, we welcome your Holy Spirit right now to every heart that is open. Open your heart and tell Jesus, I'm sorry, I don't like the things of the Spirit. I like the things of the world. Forgive me, cleanse me, help me, Jesus. Lord, 
I compromise on worldly values, on spiritual values. Forgive me, Lord. Cleanse me. Forgive me for my envy, for my jealousy, for my greed, for my idolatrous heart. Wash me, Lord. Wash me, O God. Wash me. Shake robo kosan. My envy, my greed, my covetousness, the idols in my heart. Idols in my heart, I bring it to you, Lord. I seek after the pleasure of this world, the pleasure of flesh, the riches of this world. My wrong fault line, the stronghold in my mind tonight be broken, be pulled down in the name of Jesus. Every stronghold of the mindset be broken, be pulled out from tonight in the name of Jesus. All of you, I want you to just yield to the Holy Spirit wherever you are. Open your heart. In the name of Jesus, every stronghold that, that are not consistent with your holiness, O oh God, be broken, be pulled down in the name of Jesus. Every stronghold of the mind tonight be broken. Every demonic stronghold, fleshly stronghold, harlotry stronghold, fleshly, every sinful stronghold, be pulled out in the name of Jesus. Be pulled out in the name of Jesus. The blood of Jesus be applied on every mind tonight. Every mind, every heart, every imagination. Flow, Holy Spirit, blood of Jesus, flow in this place. Blood that flows from your forehead tonight. Receive in Jesus' name. Receive forgiveness. Receive healing right now deep inside you. Receive right now in the name of Jesus. Receive right now in the name of Jesus. I speak healing. I speak forgiveness. I speak mercy. I speak wholeness in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Keep on yielding to the Holy Spirit wherever you are. Wherever you are, keep on yielding to the Holy Spirit. Help me, Lord. Have mercy on me. Change me. Sharabaka serene. Shoko roboko shikarabasam. Yeah, a little bit more time. A little more time. A few more minutes. Come on. Open your heart. Keep on confessing. Let it flow. Let it flow. A few more minutes. Shikarabakosomoshan. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Let the blood of Jesus flow in our midst tonight. Let forgiveness flow, let mercies flow. Strongholds be broken, Lord. Freedom, Lord. Freedom. Shikarababariano. Voices. I see voices in your mind. Be silenced in the name of Jesus. Wrong voices that you have been hearing and listening to. Be broken tonight in the name of Jesus. I see voices that troubles you, that cause you to be fearful. Voices that cause you to be anxious. Tonight be silent in the name of Jesus. Demonic voices be broken from your life in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lies, deception be broken in the name of Jesus. Right now, in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. The word of God like a hammer, shattering every stronghold of the mind, shattering every stronghold, break it in the name of Jesus. The word of God coming to you like a hammer, shattering every demonic stronghold in the name of Jesus. Every bondage just be broken because through the word of God. All of you just receive as you keep on yielding, something is happening inside you. God is doing a work inside you. Your bondages are being broken. You are being set free. You are receiving freedom, healing, and wholeness. But you gotta concentrate and focus on Him. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. 
thank you, Lord, the stone that David hurled on Goliath. Right now, let it shatter every Goliath's forehead in the name of Jesus. Receive in Jesus' name the stone that Jesus comes and break every bondage. Break it. Every addiction be broken in the name of Jesus. Every addiction be broken in the name of Jesus. Come out in the name of Jesus. Every wrongful addiction command it to be broken right now in the name of Jesus. The stone be hurled at you in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus comes again, you uncircumcised Philistines. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is against every addiction. Be broken in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want you as to continue in that place. Close your eyes. Just close your eyes and see the blood of Jesus flowing. See the blood of Jesus. Yes, the red blood of Jesus over you, over your minds. Erasing, erasing, forgiving, cleansing, healing, setting you free. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit, right now in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Wherever you are, receive, receive. I apply the blood of Jesus over your eyes. Receive the blood of Jesus over the eyes. The blood of Jesus over the eyes. Over your spiritual eyes. Over your spiritual ears. Your spiritual heart. Your perception, your imagination, your mind, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, hallelujah. Let it flow, let it flow, let it flow, let it flow. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, oh. crown of thorns that was placed on your head. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. My brother, my sister, each time, each time the enemy is displaced, every time the blood of Jesus washes us, purifies us, now the, the Lord can fill us with the right thing. Now the Lord can bless us and fill us. If there was lust, now, the, now God can fill us with love. If there was envy, now allow the Holy Spirit to fill you with love. When there was compromise, allow now God to put